So you just received a pallet of new network equipment and you need to begin configuring them for deployment across your network. But where do you begin? Well, luckily, most vendors provide a list of basic configuration items for you to be able to deploy your device across your network and manage it remotely. Recommended initial configurations will vary by vendor. However, they typically will include IP addressing, host name, user information, and remote access protocol configuration. For today's video, we're going to be doing a quick walkthrough of the initial configuration on a Juniper SRX340. This device is a firewall appliance by design, however, it is often marketed as an enterprise router for small to medium sized businesses. So with no more ado, let's get at it. All right, so the first thing that we're going to want to do is we're going to want to make sure that we're actually in the Juniper operating system. When we boot up a device for the first time, you're probably going to be accessing via console cable. If you connect via console cable, your device is going to automatically show two things. One, it's going to log you in as Amnesiac. That simply means that this device has no memory of ever having been configured. It's a blank slate for you. It's also going to show you the operating system version and it's going to show a percent sign prompt. This means that you're not actually loaded into the Juniper operating system yet. You are actually loaded into the Unix undershell, which there's also a newer Linux undershell for newer Junos devices. Simply typing CLI is going to get you into the Juniper operating system. A really basic step, but it's often overlooked in Juniper documentation for some reason. After we log in, we're going to be taken into operational mode. However, if we want to be able to configure anything on this device, we're going to need to be able to move into configuration mode, which is easily accomplished by just typing the word configure. Now, the first thing you're going to notice is that right now our prompt only says root. There's no device host name included in our prompt. And usually that's your way of identifying what device you're logged into. So the first step we're going to do is we're actually going to configure a host name. So we're going to use the command set system host name. You'll also want to specify what you want your host name to be. In this case, I'm just going to name it my SRX. You'll notice that the name didn't automatically appear in the prompt and that is because we need to commit the changes later on. So let's just go ahead and move on to the next step. The next thing we're going to want to do is set the root password. The root password is necessary because Juniper will not allow you to commit any changes without one. So we're going to go ahead and set a plain text password. When we specify plain text password, we simply mean that we are not entering a hashed value. Next up, we're going to set the domain name. This is important if we want to use SSH in order to log in across multiple domains. In this case, I'm just going to go with brainmelt.local. Not a real domain, but it's going to get the job done for our purposes here. Now, just to make sure that any of these changes are taking effect, we're going to want to go ahead and commit our changes by typing the word commit. This will check and make sure that we haven't performed any configuration items that are going to conflict with each other. This commit cannot go through unless we have set a root password, which is why we had to complete that in this step. You can also go ahead and wait until the very end to commit. However, for novice users, I recommend committing often so that if you do run into issues, you can easily back out to the previous point where you committed. Next up, we're going to want to set IP addressing on the device. We want to be able to remotely access it, so layer three addressing is an absolute must. Don't worry about the absolute syntax here as that's a little bit beyond the scope of this video. However, in a nutshell, our syntax is going to identify a specific interface and we are going to place an IP address directly on that interface. In this case, we're going with gigabit ethernet number six. However, most Juniper devices will include a dedicated management port that you can use for the purpose of remote management so that you're not having to hog up your downstream interfaces. We'll go ahead and provide an IP address here and commit. Now, normally you will want to configure some sort of remote access protocol. However, Juniper SRX do have the SSH protocol enabled by default, so you do not have to complete that step. However, just in case you're not working on a Juniper SRX, maybe you're working on an EX series switch or something else, we're gonna go ahead and include what you need in order to configure SSH. So we're going to go with set system services and then if you get lost, you can use the question mark to see what services you're allowed to enable or disable on this device. And in this case, we're just going to use the SSH protocol. 
From here, you can set a number of different options. However, you can go ahead and hit enter just on this and it will function just fine. You can also enable other services like Telnet. However, Telnet is extremely insecure and you shouldn't use it unless you absolutely have to. Going ahead and committing our changes. Now, if you're going to be remotely connecting to your device via SSH, you're going to require some sort of username and password with various levels of permissions built in, which is exactly why we're going to set that up now. So in this case, we're going to go set system login user. So this tells us we want to create a user. The next thing up is we need to pick a name for our user. In this case, we're going to name it brain melt. And then you need to pick a class. There are four predetermined classes, but if you're just starting out, you're probably just going to want to build a super user account. This has permissions to do everything. And then just like with the root, we have the option to either enter an encrypted password, a password that is already hashed, or we can enter a plain text password, which the device will hash for you. In this case, we're going to enter the plain text password by using authentication, plain text password, and then enter our password. It'll ask for the new password and ask you to confirm just like with root. And then of course, we're gonna commit. Now we're going to go ahead and set the time. In this case, I'm located in the Los Angeles time zone. So we'll go ahead and use that one. System clock time is extremely important for a number of reasons, but most of it comes down to simple synchronization. If your clock is off by any degree in any sort of computing device, it's going to create problems somewhere down the road. So it's a good idea to set this manually, or at the very least to configure it to connect to a specific NTP server. The next step is optional, and that is to set what's called a rescue configuration. This is the basic configuration that you can always back out to if you ever need to. And in this case, we're going to set what is currently running on this device as our rescue configuration. If the device becomes completely inoperable for any reason for disaster recovery purposes, we can revert back to this rescue configuration and begin working with it once again. Now let's go ahead and test out our configuration. Let's go ahead and attempt to log in remotely to this device using the SSH protocol, using the IP address that we entered earlier and sticking with the basic information as we didn't change the port number. And we are now in. So there you have it. That was the initial configuration for your devices. This is a pretty basic walkthrough, but it's also fairly universal and has been for years. If you have any further questions or comments, I'd love to hear them down below. Until next time, it's been real, and we hope to see you all here next time on Brain Melt University.